Okay, okay. Uh, well, thanks, Paul, for introducing me. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm from UC Berkeley myself in the physics department, the chemistry, and then in mechanical engineering. And uh, um, I'm going to give you an overview of research that we're doing up at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab re related to demand response. The funding is primarily from the California Energy Commission, and Ron Hoffman over by the door has been working with us for many years. Um, we also, uh, as I mentioned here, there's funding from the California Institute for Energy and the Environment. So I'm going to um, reference back some of our projects from almost 15 years ago in setting the stage for what we're doing today. Um, I'm going to give you a basic introduction into demand response because that may be a new idea for some of you. I'll talk about our work in automating it. I'll talk about some of these boxes that I brought with us today. I'm going to try to move fairly quickly so I do get through the material in enough time to leave some questions and answers. I'll talk about energy information systems, and I'm actually going to be showing you data from the UC Santa Barbara campus, and we're hoping to have data like that from Berkeley and Merced and, and other places. And then the relationship between energy and fish efficiency and demand response. I'll be talking about that as well. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into it. Now, first of all, um, many of you know that the California ISO uh, has emergency um, sort of uh, framework. And in California, the system's becoming peakier. So as we have a lot of growth out in the hot climates, there's, the cooling loads are increasing. So the system peak is growing faster than the energy. And that's a problem. It's very expensive. You need power plants. You need transmission. You need distribution systems to support those peak days. And uh, a peak day, by the D ISO's definition, has to do with how much uh, of the reserve level they have. They have 7%. Let me just tell the students, many of them may not know what ISO stands for. Yeah, it's the independent system operator. Which is sitting above PG&E and those. Right. So they help manage the grid. And uh, when the ISO... Uh, sees that, they're, that the peak that they forecast is within 7% of the capacity on the system. They call stage 1, stage 2 at 5%, and stage 3 at 3%, and they'll even initiate rotating outages. And we had rotating outages uh, early, uh, several years ago. Uh, and you can see on my slides, we actually had these statewide outages in the early part of 2001. That is very expensive for society. Uh, people don't like the lights to go out. Businesses don't like the lights to go out. There's a lot, there's a lot of, of security and, and issues when we have these kinds of uh, problems. This is what the low duration curve looks like for California. If you line up all the hours, you'll see up here uh, we are over 50 gigawatts. And that's just a small percent of the hours. You can see here um, it's, it's less than 1% is over 45 gigawatts. So it's a very peaky system. Again, those peak hours on the hot summer days are very expensive. Now, of course, those days I showed you, those rolling outages weren't the hot days. So you can have problems in the winter as well. But in general, these are the days that drive the costs of the system. Now, there's two types of demand response. There's something called we call price response that looks at the cost of electricity in the market, and there's reliability. And there's a continuum of that. Again, those peak days are expensive, and the relationship between the wholesale and retail costs our wholesale and retail costs are really the heart of the economics. Um, but the system itself becomes less reliable when it's stressed. And it may be stressed in a region, or it may be stressed uh, because it's hot. Uh, there may be, they may be, for example, the San Francisco Peninsula has uh, growth issues. Parts of Southern California and San Diego have major growth issues. And that makes the system less, um, less reliable. Uh, the system's aging. Uh, and uh, that's a problem for California as well. So the research that Paul and I have both been doing relates to the, those bottom two bullets, the idea of creating a real-time infrastructure to automate getting the demand to respond when the supply side has problems, and that the demand response infrastructure that we built has to be able to interoperate with older technology. On the bottom here is a graphic, and you'll see uh, that the base load in the winter time is a little bit below 40 gigawatts. And the curves you see there, that's a week. Every week it goes up and down. The weekends use less than the weekdays. And then in the summer, it goes up a lot. And again, those are, those are the days that we're developing demand response around. Now, the Demand Response Research Center is funded by the California Energy Commission. And we do, it's a very multidisciplinary field. We do research in the valuation, the economics, the markets. We do research in the tariffs. And in California, the state is trying to move us towards actually seeing prices on your utility bill that reflect these increases in the hot summer days. 
So real-time pricing as a concept has been around for a long time, but there's very little, little of it in California, and we're moving towards a future where we can have these prices that vary each hour, or maybe a critical peak price that varies uh, on some days the price goes up. Um, we care a lot about the communications infrastructure. We've been doing research to try to actually develop and disseminate those technologies. The two in green here that are in NITOX, I'm going to be focusing the rest of my talk on automations, communications, and control. We talk about end-use strategies and models. But we also care about behavior because at the end of the day, the people have to live in the buildings. And that matters a lot what the people think of the technology, what people think of the concept of using less on the peak day. And we also work with industry. We, we've been automating the demand response in several large industrial facilities in California. And the technology is potentially interoperable with homes, with commercial buildings, and with industrial facilities. So again, it's communications infrastructure is what we're doing. Now this graph is to help you understand that we're not talking about load management every day. On the, on the right-hand column, the left-hand column here is the energy efficiency that we do every day. We do it to save money. We do it for the environment. We do it with good systems that are operated well. That's basically what energy efficiency is. You put in, you get, put in a more efficient light bulb, you get the same light for the same, look, much less power. So the level of service is the same, but you're doing it with much less energy. The middle column is something people are much less familiar with. That column has to do with the, I'm trying to find my mouse here, what we call daily peak load management. And buildings over 200 kilowatts have a time of use charge and a demand charge. So they actually have higher prices in the middle of the day than at night. So they can, they can use technologies actually to shift to the nighttime. For example, UC Merced has thermal storage. So they actually build cooling at night and use it at the daytime when the prices are more expensive and they've built that cooling at night. Um, uh, so we care about flattening the demand. And I call that limiting and shifting. So we limit the demand and we can shift the demand every day to minimize your time of use charges. The third column is demand response. We don't do this every day. We only do it on special days because the service level we're providing may actually change. We may not have the same temperatures of cooling. We may not have the same lighting levels. We don't do that every day. We do that on special days and it's all about control because the more granular the controls are in the building, either the lighting, the HVAC, this is where wireless is going to help. Your ability to reduce the service level in a particular zone or throughout the building is enhanced by better control. Now this graph, I'm not going to go through all these bullets, but what we're doing with the buildings on the demand side is part of this universe of this new smart grid concept. And there's a lot of ideas in smart grid. There's transmission systems, uh, DER is distributed energy resources, energy storage, whether it's electrical storage or cool storage. A lot of interest in batteries, a lot of interest in flywheel systems, because it, really managing those peaks is very important and managing the load shape over the day. Distribution systems uh, are part of the smart grid, uh, security, and of course, demand response. So we're only one of the bullets on this big universe, and it's what part of the system needs to know what else is going on in other parts of the system. So this is, you'll be hearing a lot about this over the next few decades as we try to bring information technology, controls, and computing systems into the electric grid. As, as we put renewables on the system, this is even more important. So we care a lot about the carbon, we care a lot about the total energy. We care about what the grid is doing overall. Now I'm going to talk about automating demand response. Um, the goal of what we've been doing is to try to develop a low-cost infrastructure. Um, could we develop something that buildings can listen to? Is there, can, are buildings ready to listen to common signals? And once they get the signal, uh, can they do something? Can they, can they shed? Are buildings ready to shed? And we'll talk about what today's buildings can do, and what buildings in the future might be able to do. So essentially what we've developed is a continuous, two-way, secure automation infrastructure. It's a client-server architecture where the demand response automation server is continuously sending signals out to buildings. And in California, we actually have 100 buildings, over 100 buildings using this now throughout California. San Diego has an automation server, so Cal Edison has one, and pg e has one. So we're actually working and commercializing this and offering it. We use open interoperable standards and we're working with a variety of standards groups around the country to actually make this 
a formal standard. So anybody could build the automation server, and anybody could build the client. Uh, the client can sit at the building, or the client could be uh, next to a lighting controller, or the client could be at Target in Minnesota and control many targets. And that's actually what we're doing. We'll talk about that. Um, the timing of the notification is very important, because the system can handle uh, real-time pricing, it can handle hourly pricing, or it can handle day-ahead information. So tomorrow is a special day, and maybe I want to pre-cool the building because it's going to be a warm day. So we actually send that information out with this automation system that the building is aware of what tomorrow is going to be like or what it's going to be like an hour from now, or maybe even five minutes from now, or maybe even 30 seconds from now. So we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Now this is a graph showing you the basic, some of the basic features of what we're doing. On the left hand here is the utility system. And demand response in California is being run through the utilities. So PG&E has about a dozen different types of demand response programs. Some are voluntary uh, with pricing. Some are reliability-based programs where they have higher penalties if someone says they can shed load but then doesn't. And the system, they send out messages. They send out email signals. They send out pagers. And they phone the facility manager. Uh, and the meter is done over the phone every night. It dials up all these meters, and the interval data is put into a web portal, so we can get the interval, we can get the electric hourly data over the web the next day. So they actually contact this person. It's an automated notification, but it's manual response. So the facility manager then walks around, and he'll turn some lights on, he'll change some temperatures, he'll change some equipment to re try to reduce his loads. This is. Um, Essentially what we've done is we've taken this uh, signaling system that the utility uses currently that's manual into this automation server. So the automation server is actually at a server farm. It's very high secure standards, which HTTPS, SSL, uh, encryption, the type of thing they use in the banking industry. And the system is continuously sending signals out to the buildings. Uh, it sends price and reliability signals, and then the buildings send the information back. I got the price. The price changed. I got it. So it should be 30 cents. It could be 50 cents. It could be moderate. It could be high. And over here, on the right-hand side, is the building. Uh, the building uses something called a, a client. And uh, the first year that we did this, back in 2003, we did it at five buildings, and all the clients were done in software. So as you see up here, uh, we have two kinds of clients. Software only. If the building can, can host XML, a web services, that's what we use. We give it to them. So the first time we did it with Bank of America, Albertsons, a GSA building, Roche Pharmaceuticals, and UC Santa Barbara. And they all had technology. They had gotten some money from the state for enhanced automation systems. And they all had newer systems that could host XML. So all we gave them was a software program. They had all shed before, and they, they automated something they'd done before. So uh, if they didn't have uh, this ability to host XML, which new, older systems don't, then in 2004, we used this little blue box, which is an internet relay. This is Jesus Modbus. And the relay, um, uh, we put in a, about a dozen buildings. And we had trouble with the firewalls, because you had to poke a hole in the firewall. And people didn't want this on their LAN. So now we've developed this box here. This one's blue, and the one on the picture there is yellow. This is a, a client where the logic is integrated with the relay. So it actually hosts the XML. You can plug it inside a DHCP server. And it's a relay to the control system. So the energy management system is pre-programmed to respond when the relays change. So that's essentially how we do it. Um, we prefer software only. These boxes currently, pg e has about 200 of these. And they cost about 1500 bucks, And so it can be um, reduced if we had more of them on the market. Uh, but we really want to migrate towards the software. I'll describe a little more of that. This is what the uh, architecture of the system looks like. On the, on, over here on the left is the utility system. Um, and over here on the right is the building. So what we're doing is this demand response automation server is a middleware. That is taking information from the utility, putting it into internet signals, and getting it to the building. And each of these circles is a part of the information model in the demand response automation system. So, so it's sending information about events, uh, about loads, about real-time pricing, 
the buildings can opt out. So if, they, if the demand response event is being automated and nobody's touching anything, but there's a carnival at the um, Target in Hayward, they can override it and decide not to participate. Choice, customer choice we know is an important part of what we do. Now this is what a shed looks like. And I like to show this one because this one is a good example of the classic kind of building cooling load set point adjustment that we see uh, in, in the simulation models as well as in the actual buildings. It's a 130,000 square foot office building uh, in Martinez. You can see the signal comes in at noon. This is a six hour event. At noon, oops, the uh, price was um, three times the moderate price and from three to six, the, the price was five times the high price. So they actually, some of our sites only do the second three hours because doing it for six hours is a long time. In the first couple hours, they set the temperature up from 72 to 75 and they shed some load, and then in the second event, 75 to 78. So you shed, reset the zone temperature two times. You stay in the ASHRAE comfort zone, for those that are f familiar with the comfort criteria in buildings. Uh, we do interview all the buildings for several years after every event to see how it went. Were there problems? You know, we don't want protests in the hallways, but we want to get about 10%. If we can get more, great. But in general, we're able to get about 10% uh, from automating the demand response. It's a 100 degree day. And this building has been on the program for four years. Uh, through the heat storm of 2006, they never unplugged it. And we like to suggest they have Hawaiian shirt day and serve iced tea. But um, that's up to them, what they want to do, how, much, how they c communicate. The, below the curve is what we call the megawatts, And that's the shed itself. So you can see uh, we shed over 100 kilowatts um, through that event. And uh, uh, they've done this continuously for several years. This is an aggregated shed. So we take many facilities and we add them up. We have a variety of baselines. So what you're seeing here with the, uh, the green line and the purple line is a baseline, that one that does not consider weather and one that does. Because if the day is hotter than the previous days, we do weather regressions to say what they would have used on a similar temperature day. So we actually calculate a variety of baselines. And that's part of the research in demand response is modeling the, the forecasted load. And the columns on the bottom, I show the kilowatt from the moderate and the high price periods, the percent reduction. And, and here you see they've shed about 16% in the high price period on average. And they're shedding about 0.8 watts a square foot. And for those of you who are familiar with buildings, that's pretty good. Um, the average office in the United States uses 6 watts a square foot. Uh, so, so we care a lot about um, the peak demand intensity. And we can compare the watts per square foot that we get in different buildings. Now, in 2007, um, we've been commercializing what we've been doing. And we work directly with PG&E. And this is an example of a shed where you can see now the peak is close to 12 megawatts. And we're shedding a couple of megawatts. Uh, it has that classic shape, which I didn't mention back on this one, of um, going down and coming back up again, and then going down again and coming back up. Because the cooling system is unloaded. Then it comes on again once it reaches the new set point cooling system drops again and comes back up. And you see that in our sheds. Again, this is a very long period to do this for. And we're very careful that the rebound doesn't exceed the previous peaks. So we actually explicitly work when, they, when the cooling system comes back on that they don't re, 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 reach a new peak. You limit the VFDs or reset the supply temperature slowly. And there's a variety of things you can do to make sure the building doesn't hit a new peak. And that's part of what we do. Now, um, this graph shows you the kinds of things that the buildings do. And here you can see the kinds of facilities that we're working with. We've got a couple of Ikea's, Target, Walmart, office buildings, laboratories, uh, one bakery, a Sybase, Echelon, so a variety of types of facilities. And um, in this year, uh, we, gave them not a, we gave them 1000 bucks to participate, actually. Uh, more recently, they were getting incentives from PG&E. But uh, in the first few years, we didn't pay them anything. We just said, can you help us figure out whether your building is ready to do this sort of thing to, to help the state grid? And many of them are doing it because of the state grid. What do they do? Most of them reset the temperature. So that first column we call global temperature adjustment. And they're resetting the zone temperatures like we talked about. If they have newer DDC systems, direct digital control, that's pretty easy to do. If they have an older pneumatic system, then we go to the, the components. And you can see 
uh, the fan variable frequency drive, the supplier temperature increase, the chill water temperature, the fan quantity reduction, maybe pre-cooling. Some of them, some, we're actually automating pre-cooling. So that event pending signal comes in. Um, lighting, some of them will do lighting. And uh, that's one we think has tremendous potential. Winter or summer, uh, we could do lighting. And, and these are mostly the HVAC is cooling strategies. Dimming ballasts. Uh, the Echelon building has these dimmable ballasts, uh, and that's a very important strategy. Uh, one of the best technologies to support daily energy efficiency um, and demand response capability. So a dimming ballast is not a stepped control, but the ballast can actually dim. The, for buildings with daylighting, uh, when the light is sufficient for the building to have a good lighting quality, the, the ballast will actually dim. And then on a demand response day, it can go even further. So that's a technology we're spending a lot of time on, and we believe that uh, lighting is an excellent strategy. And then my one industrial site here is the bakery, and you'll see on the very end here that they actually bought extra pans for their dishwashers and turned off the dishwasher. So they put this little blue box on the dishwasher on the Sven Hartz Bakery in Oakland and turned off the dishwasher during the day. And now this um, graph shows you the uh, types of clients that the facilities used. And over the years, we've tried a variety of things. So what we've learned, of course, is that buildings can take these boxes. We're, we're putting a lot of them in. Um, but down here is kind of interesting, the ones that use the software client. Here's my here. Um, Walmart uh, works with a company called Energy ICT out of Belgium. And Walmart's putting end-use metering on all of their facilities, lighting, HVAC. And they have energy managers that are quite sophisticated. At one spot, can look at the energy use of all the Walmarts in the country. Uh, Target and Ikea. Retail chains are great um, customers for this kind of technology because they have centralized energy management. And uh, that gives us an idea of what's possible in the future when somebody remotely is looking at your data. Uh, so, so we have a variety of these different technologies. The Atom 6060 is this Modbus relay. Uh, so you'll see some of them had this in 2006. And we've changed them all out to this box because this box is remotely upgradable. We can actually change the code that we're using. And it can change from the critical peak pricing to demand bidding. So we can, we can offer different kinds of demand response uh, with this box. More flexible. Um, one thing that's interesting about what we're doing is that each of the facilities has a web portal into their demand response signals. And up here you can see here Target is on this automated critical peak pricing. Automated critical peak pricing means that on 12 days a year the price goes up for six hours. And it's a tariff. So we don't actually have to measure the baseline. Uh, their economics are built into the tariff. But if they, again, are having a carnival, they can opt out. So from this web portal, they can turn off the signal. And, it, and nothing's going to happen for their lighting or the HVAC. We were monitoring a target over in Hayward, and we actually measured the aldehydes and some of the pollutants in the store when we changed ventilation levels. They actually thought they were overventilated. And so we started looking at, OK, let's try some DR. Let's change the ventilation level and see. Most buildings, you measure CO2, because that's the way people breathe. You can see if that's the right level of ventilation. But for a retail store, it's the smelly computers and the tires and things like that. So, so we're ventilating for different things. We're not ventilating for people. We're ventilating for odor. We're ventilating for health. So, so it's very important to understand what is the building doing and why is the ventilation even being provided. Uh, so each of, the, each of the customers has a web portal like this uh, into the automation server. And we can see who's listening. We can see if the building is still online. Uh, and we can have somebody looking at the signals that go out. And Target can look at all their buildings. So we want them to be able to see the San Diego buildings and the Edison buildings and the PG&E buildings all from one spot. Now the future. Um, the, one of the interesting things about buildings is, are they optimized to begin with? So, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a few minutes. But um, on, the, on the left hand here is daily energy efficiency. Um, and everybody, that, that's something people generally understand. But as we move to the right, uh, we're getting into domains that are very important about whether the service level in the building is, is optimized. Time of use energy minimized, so daytime, nighttime. Peak demand charges. Day ahead demand response. So I know tomorrow's a demand response day. What do I do to minimize my costs? 
real-time demand response. Maybe I have hour ahead pricing, and I want to know um, at, at 1 o'clock or at 2 o'clock, is the price changing, and can I do anything now? And then all the way to the right is spinning reserve, and we call that fast DR. So, so now I care a lot about those dimming ballasts because they can respond very quickly. And it may be in the future that the demand side is actually listening to and helping with spinning reserve markets where it's actually looking at the frequency on the grid and it's participating in spinning reserve where we, we don't have as much power plants sitting there, but the demand side is helping balance the system. So that's, the, that's a very uh, lucrative, potentially lucrative part of the electric grid uh, to get the demand side to participate in spinning reserve. And the technology that we're developing for communicating with the demand side is potentially an uh, infrastructure for that kind of communications. <clears throat> um, another thing that we do is we do whole building simulations. And this is the uh, DR quick assessment tool that uses something called Energy Plus. This is a whole building simulation tool. F typically, the facilities folks have no idea what to do to take a notch out of their load shape, to change their load shape. And this tool allows, uh, it's, a, it's an office building prototype, and you can move it around different climates of California, and you can try different strategies. So you can get a building, that's, say a 50,000 square foot building, uh, and change some temperatures, calibrate it to your building, and, and try to get an idea with a simulation tool about how many kW you might save if you try different things. The tool was initially developed because we've been doing some pre-cooling research. And uh, Ed Aarons' group has been involved with us here. When we pre-cool, we want to be sure that in the morning people aren't freezing. Uh, and, and we're going to push the boundaries of the comfort zone. So b bring a sweater. It's going to be a hot day. You know? uh, so so uh, uh, we pre-cool the building prior to the demand response time. And then we care also in the DR time that we haven't made the building too warm. So we're pushing the range, of the, and, and Ed's helped us with uh, a kiosk. Actually, we had a bank where people were saying, am I comfortable or not, different times of the day. And you could correlate what their comfort survey results were uh, back to uh, how they participated in these pre-cooling events. So there's a web survey that we use. And in general, it's gone quite well. The mass of the building itself is a cool storage device. So we're going to start building buildings. We all know in New Mexico, and in Arizona, historically, there's a lot of mass in the buildings. And in California, we're going to probably see mass come back in because it's gone out because of low first cost. But in general, uh, we can shed load, and we can make people more comfortable during the demand response if we pre-cool. Um, this past summer, one that's not on here, we did a building in San Bernardino because SoCal Edison said, we'll do it in a really hot climate. And it was 105 outside. And you could still get some demand reduction um, with the pre-cooling strategies. Now, um, I'm going to take a quick drink here. People often say to us, um, if I can do it on a demand response day, why can't I do it every day? And uh, we say, well, maybe you can. And then you learn about, is your building even working right to begin with? So the process of saying, can I, can I shed load in my building? really gets the operator thinking about, is it energy is already optimized? And we, we call that commissioning. Uh, we call it retro commissioning, where you go and you tune the building up, and you get it to work the way it's supposed to work according to design intent. Because in buildings, uh, economizers are broken, dampers are stuck, sensors are miscalibrated, sensors are in the wrong location, fans get left on at night. I mean, the real day-to-day the real -day, um, state of most buildings is quite poor. So. Um, we don't mind if you try it at demand response and say, I can use it every day. And duct static reset, all kinds of control strategies actually end up being good daily operations ideas. Um, so if you have DDC, uh, we, we are trying to get uh, these buildings to work right in the first place. Um, for what we do in lighting, there's a continuum of more granular control. Um, a lot of buildings in California have what's called bi-level switching. So they can do fi fixture switching, lamp switching, step dimming. Uh, there's, a, again, a variety of strategies to, to get to that granularity and control. Um, and I also mentioned this Title 24 um, concept. The building code in California now hosts this what we call global temperature adjustment, where you can uh, reset the building from one point. And that's uh, part of the DDC strategies. The HVAC system has to have the capability to have centralized control. And that, again, it gets back to. Are, can buildings do this? This picture over here 
is a, a picture from our guide. We've actually written a guide for practitioners based on the kind of control system and HVAC they have. They can see what kind of uh, DR strategies might be feasible in their building. So <clears throat> we've been trying to develop very practical guides for facilities folks to deploy their DR strategies. Now I'm going to um, go back in time and I'm going to talk a little about some work we did almost 15 years ago and how it relates to uh, this demand response activity. This is a picture from a project that uh, Carl Brown was involved in in uh, 1993 and it's a 160 Sansom. Um, our ISDN line cost us $10,000 a year back then. This is before the web browsers were being used and the theory of this project was if building operators had better information, they'd run the building better. So we, t we, we interviewed office, offices in LA and San Francisco. We chose the person, not the building. Uh, we were using something called participant action research, where you choose the person and you study, if they had a more sophisticated system, what would they do? An expert system should clone an expert. So we, we put in a metering system. We put in flow meters, kilowatt meters. We had minute data. We had a silicon graphics worth station. And we gave it to them and said, what would you do if you had this? You know, how could you run the building better? And they ended up doing fast Fourier transforms on the fan power because there was a, it turned out there was a, the belt wasn't tight. You know, so they were doing things that we wouldn't even have thought of. Uh, but they did a lot of things. And, and so we learned, yes, building operators, not all of them wanted, but if they had better data, they could see these problems that we were talking about before because control systems are not good performance monitoring tools. And that, that needs to change. We have to link control and information management. So we, we did this project. And these two graphs here are an example of the building was out of control. Uh, we actually found it's very common in buildings that things are hunting. Uh, the towers are cycling on and off. Uh, and and the, the loops aren't tuned well. Uh, so they found they could really figure out what their control system was even doing. They could improve comfort. They could even extend the equipment life because it's not banging on and off as often. And they wanted three things that today are available but weren't available then. They wanted a continuous archive rather than dumping trend logs into Excel files. They wanted uh, real-time graphical analysis and they wanted remote access to the data so they could get it over a web browser. And, and that, that we had some companies come and look at what we were doing. And this company, now this, this one I'll show you just quickly, this is an inlet vein control problem where the chiller uh, uh, the um, a guy came to service the chiller, and when he left, the chiller was banging on and off. And w on the on the right hand side here, we wouldn't have seen it if we didn't have the minute data. Uh, but that guy who worked on that chiller was never let into the building again. So you could actually see whether the maintenance folks were doing their job right. Now, UC Santa Barbara uh, has a system that is more uh, examples of what's currently available, and uh, They've been actively working with their facilities management. Uh, they have an energy information system from a company called Silicon Energy that came and visited our system in San Francisco. Uh, 30 minutes a day they spent approximately browsing through the data. Uh, they look at time series data. So, so actually what they did, they didn't even have all the meter data on one system. Uh, so they, they, they you know, from a, a web portal they could, they could look at the data. And uh, they, they browse through it. And this is an example of an actual graph from their physical sciences building. Um, the building was running flat out. The building it wasn't, and they, they actually saw they weren't for turning the fans off at night. So, so just by browsing the data, they saw the load shape wasn't right. And when we do DR, we see things like this as well. So we actually see nighttime waste, morning warm-up peaks, high chiller peaks, and things like that. Um, and their economics actually the system was part of a bigger retrofit activity, so they used it to plan retrofits, uh, but the system itself paid back in about a year from people. Okay, it's all about the people looking at the data. It's not automated diagnostics, which I, ideally it should be. Uh, so we go from systems like this, where, where when people look at data, they can find waste, to what are we going to be doing in the future? And, um, for demand response, our real opportunity is to move towards more granular control, as I mentioned. And we have to understand if the lighting system or the HVA system is first of all optimized, and then if we're going to go into DR mode, uh, what does it mean for our service level to be reduced? Because we're not even measuring service levels to begin with. So we actually need to know 
Uh, are people comfortable? Uh, is, 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 it, is it overlit? Is it underlit? Is, is the daylight dimming working? So there's a lot of controls issues there. Now this picture here is a vision of what we're trying to build for the future. And it's a vision we've had for quite a while, but it's a vision that is finally starting to take form. Um, cool roofs, uh, automated sensors and feedback systems, um, dimming ballast, as I mentioned, weather station prediction, so you know what tomorrow's weather is going to be and you build the right amount of cooling or you do some pre-cooling. Uh, we have uh, buildings like this, like the New York Times, which is an all-glass building with dimmable ballast and underfloor air systems, and we built the DR strategies in, uh, in the very, very beginning when they put the dimming lighting system in. Um, so there's a lot of examples of tunable windows. In th at the New York Times building, which was just completed, the glazing actually moves when there's too much glare. So that it has movable shades and daylight dimming uh, that are integrated, so, and it's automated. So, so we're actually making the buildings more intelligent, and we need to do this if we're really going to do the demand response right. So there's a, there's a huge agenda here for uh, better sensors. Um, and the key thing that, that I'm going to say, the most important thing in my whole talk is that the way we operate the building and the energy they use is not integrated. So you get a utility bill once a month, but you really don't know what yesterday's energy was. So, so when, we, when we pick a, te a temperature set point or a lighting level, we're not doing that in thinking about energy. And, and that has to change. We have to have energy in the loop as part of the operations. Now, once we have that energy in the loop, it is very non-trivial to say, what is our objective? Are we minimizing CO2? Are we minimizing kilowatt hours? Are we minimizing dollars? Uh, and, and are we participating in demand response? And we care about all these kinds of things. We care about uh, emissions on the grid. Are we buying clean power? Are we generating on site? Uh, are we uh, able to do demand response? Do we know what our tariff structure is? Um, and, and all of these things are sort of a multi-objective multi, uh, optimization. And if I take these three systems, a conventional variable air volume system, an ice water system, uh, or a variable air volume with pre-cooling, you get very different answers on how to run the building to optimize against any of these criteria. So it's actually quite a challenge if you talk to the lead program from the U.S. Green Buildings Council or from a, 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 a simulation model for Title 24, you get very different answers on what to put in the building and how to run it. Now, if I had these models um, as part of my optimization, I might be able to take this load shape, and instead of getting that shape that I showed you earlier, I could actually make it flat so the chiller's not coming on and off. I could actually pre-cool and control some of the loads in the building to, to shape the, the load shape. Um, but I, I really can't do that today uh, because uh, I don't have the information from the controls of the sensors to make, to make that integrated. And this is my last slide. I actually uh, finished uh, five minutes early, so I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Um, but essentially what we're doing is we're taking this demand response ideas that I talked about and turning them into a new mode. So we have morning warm-up mode. We have occupied mode. We might have night cleaning mode. And now we have demand response mode. So we actually put the building into a low power mode, like your battery when it's running on, uh, your laptop when it's running on battery mode. The service level's reduced. Uh, but it's still providing service. It's just a reduced level of service. And that's, the mo that's a very important idea. We don't really know how to put a building into low power mode. Put the refrigerator, put the washer, put the, put the lights. And some components, HVAC and lighting, we have some ideas. But, but we want to put the building into a low power mode. And we need more intelligence in decision making to do that. We need to know, we need to have better information on what different parts of the building are actually doing. Uh, we need to have feedback so that the operator actually can see the energy use, uh, maybe the end uses, the lighting, and the HVAC, and financial feedback systems. So really, at the end of the day, what's going to drive them is the dollars. Dollars compared to other buildings, dollars compared to yesterday, dollars compared to a year ago. Uh, and we need to embed these kind of communication systems into the controls. So the system is listening to supply side information. Um, and so there's this need to be able to organize this information. And I'm going to make um, one uh, announcement before I ask, uh, answer questions about uh, a, a project at UC Merced. We're actually looking for a grad student to help 
in evaluating and looking at some of the performance of the Merced campus data. And then Carl Brown, you can talk to him afterwards about that position. So I'll stop right there. So, question on the floor. Yes, let me, you, let me give you the microphone because we, we tape these. And Hi, uh, my name is Sam Saxena. I'm uh, with the Combustion Analysis Lab here on campus. And I'm curious um, if you've looked at applying the technologies that those little boxes and, and some of the communication systems that you've talked about. Have you looked at applying that, say, into the manufacturing sector, which maybe isn't such a big deal for California, but places where I'm from, like Ontario, it's, it's a huge deal. Um, are there any ideas as to how it could be applied in that industry? Yeah, and I, I should have mentioned we have over 10 megawatts of demand response on industrials this year. We, in California now, we have about 25 megawatts using these boxes. And this last year, we put it in several industrial facilities. We put it in a compressed air. We put it in a steel recycling uh, facility. Um, so so uh, we actually do s believe that this is uh, very uh, transferable. The ability to do it depends on how well the controls at the manufacturing firms are centralized. Because do you, and maybe you go, you go come in and then go wireless to the devices. But uh, it's some of the new control systems uh, in manufacturing can host the XML that we talked about. Uh, so we won't need the boxes, but currently we are installing the boxes in manufacturing also. And do plant managers tend to respond well to um, wanting to scale back some of the demand? It's a, historically, in demand response, there's been an interruptible programs where, where they'll do huge disruptive sheds. Um, some can, and they get a lot of money for to get a big discount in their tariff if they can. Uh, we're actually looking at smaller sheds um, uh, more often. Uh, to, to evaluate how feasible that is. And it's totally dependent on the kind of manufacturing and the season that you're hitting them. Because the food service, for example, if you're, if you're processing tomatoes in August, they, they don't have much uh, capability to, because they want to look at uh, the core processes versus supporting systems. So, so, but in general, it, it is a research topic we're looking at. And, we, and we're trying to understand the, uh, uh, for which industries is, is it kind of a low-hanging fruit. Good questions there. Uh, Professor Evans. Thank you, Paul. Um, this week's Economist has an amazing statistic, which is that half the world's population lives in countries with a growth rate exceeding 7%. So if you think we have problems in California, think of the problems in, say, Bolivia that are mm -hmm. looming. And I'm wondering what's going on abroad. Mm -hmm. Well, there's certainly huge load growth, as you know. Um, we're, we are talking with several, Japan, Europe, uh, a little bit with China. Uh, but we're, we, ideally, you'd build this into the system uh, there as, you, as it grows. And the need for demand response in developing countries is certainly exists as well. So, so, and we, are, we actually do have a project that's looking at, China, at, like at India. Uh, so, so the, actually, up at LBNL, there is an international energy studies group that's looking at bringing some of this abroad. More questions? Yeah. Uh, um, so I was just wondering, some of the examples you had of like the targets and the WalMarts, based on this demand response, once they use it, how much does that like maybe per year save them? Per year, yeah. Just wondering. Um, in in general, it might only be one to two percent. It's a pretty small percent. Um, we are finding both Target and Walmart, we're doing it because it's coming around the country. So Texas, they're doing it in Texas, doing it in New Jersey. There's certain, it depends a lot on the, um, the markets, the electric markets, whether the utilities and the ISOs, these independent system operators, are offering demand response. Uh, the national chains uh, see it cropping up, and the version that they get in California is going to be different. Uh, meaning that the programs are going to be different. And we are trying to make this a national standard. Um, so, so it might be a small part of their, their annual energy use, but they're trying to, they are aware of the good green citizen sort of um, uh, doing the right thing. So that's part of the value. Even so, I'm guessing 1% of Walmart's energy bill is quite a large number. Right, right. I mean, we're typically looking to individual store. Yeah. So, yeah. so we don't scale it back up. Uh, Through the whole corporation. Right. And yeah. we chose one in Bakersfield because it was hot. You know, we, we were actually explicitly asked to go, you know, don't keep doing it in the Bay Area. 
do it in parts but, of But even so, what, what is the annual uh, bill of well, a, a my, the, the, I mean, the buildings are about a, a couple bucks a square foot. I don't, I don't know the annual bill uh, of Walmart, but I'm sure it's pretty high. Because yeah. they're internationally growing as well. Yeah, okay. Another question, yes. Do you think hey, it would be possible to... Do you think it would be possible to link uh, deferrable loads with intermittent generators such as wind in order to achieve a high level penetration? Right, yeah. Wind? Well, that's certainly the... Um, Do you know if it's done at all? Well, renewables are intermittent. So the value of demand response when you have intermittent supply can be significant. And we're actually starting to look at nighttime loads or wintertime loads. So in, in the spinning reserve markets, you certainly want to be able to, I mean, it's kind of like putting your put, foot on an accelerator. Uh, having the demand side back off if the supply side's backing off is a good thing. So we do imagine in the future, not all end-use devices, but some end-use devices uh, might be willing to back off for 10 minutes. Uh, there is a project with uh, SoCal Edison on spinning reserves uh, that, that is looking at this. So yes, that's the, that's the idea, is the demand side could help balance the system. Any more questions? Um, this was a fantastic talk. Please come again next week for a telemedicine uh, discussion. And please join me in a wonderful round of applause for Marianne on a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thanks.